understand. Okay. Hi, good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's webinar. So glad you could join us. Happy Wednesday. Tonight's webinar is the latest in DCM genetics research and therapies in development. Um, as always, we have all participants' microphones muted upon joining. If you do have any questions tonight, and we hope that you do, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And uh, we will have a, a large Q&A segment tonight, so we hope you'll use that. Uh, behind the scenes, but, oh, first of all, I'm Jay Ann Rock, for those of you who don't know me, um, from the DCM Foundation. I'll be your host tonight. And behind the scenes, we have Heather Musgrove <laughs> assisting with technology. Um, again, if you have any questions, drop them in the Q&A option. So let's get rolling. For those of you who don't know, the DCM Foundation was founded in 2017 with a mission to provide hope and support to patients and families with dilated cardiomyopathy through research, advocacy, and education. During tonight's webinar, we are going to have uh, the largest segment is the first portion, which is about the latest in DCM research. During this portion, we will share a summary of recent results from the DCM Precision Medicine Study. And this will be done with Dr. Ray Hirschberger and Dr. Elizabeth Jordan. Both are investigators with the DCM Precision Medicine Study. And we will have a large component of tonight's uh, event will be questions and answers. So please do put your questions into the Q&A feature. Uh, the last portion of tonight's event is going to be information regarding some of the latest DCM therapies in development. And I think you'll find that very fascinating. So stay tuned for that. Next slide. Tonight's speakers, Dr. Ray Hirschberger is a professor of medicine, a heart failure and transplant cardiologist, and a clinical and laboratory scientist who is the founder and principal investigator for the DCM research project. He and his group continue their research efforts to discover and understand the genetics and genomics of human dilated cardiomyopathy and translate new knowledge into the practice of cardiovascular medicine. Dr. Elizabeth Jordan is an assistant professor in the Division of Human Genetics at the Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center in Columbus, Ohio. She joined the faculty in 2017. Her clinical role is genetic counselor in the Cardiovascular Genetics and Genomic Medicine Clinic an inherited arrhythmia clinic. Professor Jordan received her MMSC degree from Emory University and has worked as a genetic counselor for several years. As a licensed and certified genetic counselor with expertise in cardiovascular genetics, coupled with previous clinical experience in cancer and medical genetics, she supervises recruitment activities, conducts variant adjudications, assists in clinical and genomic data collection, and collaborates in data analysis and manuscript development. So thank you to both our speakers for being with us tonight. Uh, and with that, without further ado, I will turn the floor over to Dr. Ray Hirschberger. Dr. Hirschberger. Uh, thank you, Jan. Um, <clears throat> you can hear me okay? Yes. So uh, I would end, um, if we could get Elizabeth on the screen too with me, um, <clears throat> I would like, uh, we're, Elizabeth and I are delighted to be here this evening and uh, to help with this event. Um, we've already been introduced. It's a little bit tricky. Uh, we presented this big event on the 29th of July and, and there were a lot of questions that came in from the audience. Some of them, most of them got, got some answer, but some really didn't at all. And then some could deserve additional uh, comment. And then also we, we had a feeling from that, from that event that there would be a lot more um, questions that would come forward. And so this is an opportunity really for anyone who uh, was on that event to ask your questions. I see there's already one question in uh, that's a totally on target question about peripartum cardiomyopathy that's recovered. We're gonna come to that. And before the, the problem with this, um, design is that some of you may not have been on that reveal event. 
And so I'm going to do a very brief introduction of uh, that we used for that event to at least frame frame what we did. And then we'll open it up for question and answer um, and uh, go from there. So I'm going to share my screen and uh, show um, kind of explain uh, what this was. So this was uh, a July 29 event, um, almost a couple of hours long. So that's the other thing is we really can't cover this material in one if, in one talk tonight. You already know who I am. We had our precision medicine study participants um, who were the primary invited guests, that is the participants of this study. And I'll tell you what that was. We also have some, uh, uh, really we invited all of our Research participants through the years, our discovery study participants, our legacy study participants. And then also this was a conjoint effort with the DCM Foundation. So we invited all of those of you who are part of the DCM Foundation who listen to the DCM uh, webinars and such to also participate. And then the other other interested healthcare professionals. You know, you know what this is, you know about the DCM Foundation, Greg Ruff, who was uh, this was the slide design for that event on the 29th. Greg actually, uh, and this is by his permission I can share, he's the president of the foundation, he's a friend, a colleague, he also has genetic cardiomyopathy as does his family. Um, and um, this was our little blurb about uh, the follow up uh, this event tonight uh, with, uh, with Elizabeth and myself. Greg was supposed to help MC this event but actually ended up uh, in the hospital and had a heart transplant and is doing very well and, um, and we're very pleased about that. And uh, he is uh, on, let's call it medical leave for the time being. He's doing very well. He'll, he'll be back and uh, will probably uh, be um, uh, on, on site again uh, shortly. I also thanked the, the DSAM Precision Medicine Study participants. We had more than 3,000 consented individuals representing over 1,200 families. Uh, our sincere thanks. And if any of you are on the event tonight, again, we thank you for your time and effort to participate. Obviously, we can't do a study without your participation. We also thank the earlier participants of what we call the FTC study or the DCM discovery study, uh, really over the last 20 plus years. This event was presented on behalf of the DCM Consortium Investigators. This is the DCM Consortium. The clinical sites are shown here. You can go to the website. Our website is dcmproject.com and find the uh, investigators at the sites. This is the list of them. I will not go through this, but just to recognize the incredible uh, leading heart failure transplant cardiologists at these uh, 25 plus sites that, that conducted this study. Uh, we also thank the National Institutes of Health for their support. This was between the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute and the National Huma, Human Genome Research Institute, uh, over $12 million so that we spent over six years to conduct this study. And of course, um, we cannot do this without that type of support. Our clinical research team at, at OSU is extensive, shown here again, uh, just a, a quick uh, note to thank them for their effort. And then my OSU colleagues and co-investigators, Dan Kinneman, a statistical genetics PhD, Elizabeth Jordan, fantastic cardiovascular genetic counselor here with me, uh, Han Yunia, uh, uh, epidemiologist, and then uh, Wiley Burke and Gordon Huggins at uh, UW and Tufts. Why July 29? <clears throat> that was the program the e that was the evening that we had the DCM Consortium investigators who uh, many of them came into uh, Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, we had this event at, at a hotel on the campus, uh, the Blackwell Hotel, for the Summer Scientific Symposium. We've been doing scientific symposia for the last three years where we get the investigators together to discuss our current research, our current data, publications coming, and future studies and all of that, and, and they helped. There were uh, many of them helped. I will not go through that uh, in the interest of time. Uh, if there are healthcare professionals on, uh, the content that we presented was really prepared for a lay audience. And just to say that this data is in progress. The papers are being literally being written and submitted now. So this is living data. This is not it's much easier to present published data because it's already a done deal. And, uh, and this is still being curated. And, and so this was, uh, everything was accurate, but it was not a, um, 
a done deal, so to speak, in terms of, of, of all the findings that we expect, expect to observe. What we study is dilated cardiomyopathy. Uh, for those of you who already saw this slide, bear with me. For those of you who didn't, this is very important. Dilated cardiomyopathy, we think, is half of the 6 million heart failure cases. We sort out coronary heart disease or heart attack, a cause from non-coronary disease. We think that's at least a, a million and a half cases. We sort out other causes. Um, which are numerous, and most of what's left, 90 to 95%, we think of it as idiopathic or cause unknown dilated cardiomyopathy. That's after we exclude usual clinical causes, and, and henceforth tonight, we will simply call that DCM or dilated cardiomyopathy, and that's what we study. We do know if you do family studies from single center uh, studies, you can find upwards of anywhere from 20 to 35 percent will have some evidence of familial disease. Uh, and that, if it's clear evidence of familial disease, we think that it does have a genetic uh, basis, a genetic background. The problem is, is that most of what comes into our clinics um, is, is non-familial DCM, and if we screen the families, and the question is, what is the cause of that? And so we've been studying both familial and non-familial DCM really for a, a number of years with the central hypothesis or the study proposition that DCM, whether familial or non-familial, has mostly a genetic basis. And <clears throat> why we studied is shown here. Heart failure, as you know, causes severe illness and death. And even though we have drugs and devices, mechanical support, even transplant, uh, this still is enormous impact on families and patients, and of course, enormous strain on healthcare finances. We know that DCM does not start out of the blue. It takes months or years to develop. And of course, in most, in adults at least, we think that uh, most adults have a normal heart that takes months or years to develop DCM. And critically, importantly, there are no symptoms until finally uh, DCM presents with, in most cases, heart failure, sometimes arrhythmia. Uh, and, uh, and at this point, we think of it as late phase disease, even though DCM has been present. So DCM is present if one would get an echo and find it, but it's silent, has no symptoms. And in this phase, there is risk of developing DCM um, which could be considered earlier pre-DCM. And of course, that's the role for genetic testing to identify family members at genetic risk for DCM. And then we dial in regular clinical screening to detect very early development of DCM with the idea that early medical intervention can delay or prevent the onset of DCM. The idea is to really even block even full-blown DCM from, from developing. We have some very interesting studies going on, which uh, in cardiac magnetic resonance imaging right now, we've just started a new study. Our next newsletter will um, lay that out uh, in, in more detail uh, to really de to detect what we would call even a pre-DCM uh, with the idea that, that uh, to really test this idea that early intervention with, with medications might even prevent DCM. But also, uh, if a patient presents with DCM, the recommendations are that family screening is critical. Clinical screening of family members will permit diagnosis and treatment prior to advanced disease. So during this silent phase, dial in drugs, ideally to prevent this late phase disease of heart failure that needs all these advanced therapies. So that's the idea of why we do all of this. So I'm a transplant cardiologist. It works. Uh, we've saved hundreds of patients or prolonged uh, the lives of hundreds of patients with heart transplant. Uh, it does work, but it's, uh, it's really, um, that's advanced therapies. And this is really all about prevention, trying to prevent advanced disease. Let me tell you a couple slides here about the study. The study was funded in the fall of 2015. Uh, first enrollment uh, was in June of 2016. We closed our uh, proband or patient enrollment in March 15, 2020. Family member enrollment closed April 1 of this year. Uh, uh, Elizabeth is completing the, uh, the final genetic analyses uh, even as we speak, and we hope that will be um, completed really in the next 30 to 45 days. Uh, we are returning results to participants within the study. Uh, most results have been sent out, but some have not, and that's just because it takes a long time to do this analysis. Thank you for your patience. It's been a huge effort. We're learning enormous amount of new information, and thank you again for your participation. I'm going to stop, uh, stop sharing and
Um, we, uh, again, um, I was saying to Elizabeth before this started, if we have no questions, uh, whether, let's see, I was forgetting whether I was going to sing and she was going to dance or she was going to sing and I was going to dance. But we need your questions. Uh, please uh, uh, bring them in. I see uh, another one has just come in. And um, um, so I might and I think um, Elizabeth is going start to, uh, with. Jump in. Yeah, thank yeah, you. I was going to start by. Um, you know, uh, actually fielding some questions to you, Ray, because we had this first phenotypic question about people presenting with peripartum cardiomyopathy and what the relevance of that is. Um, but there are also some other phenotype questions that we didn't get to um, in the previous webinar. So maybe it'd be a good time to set some, some ground on some of these phenotype questions. Um, and I can I read them question? to you. Yeah. Should I take some Sure. Um, this first one, um, I, I think I, I'm not sure everyone can see this, so I'll read it for the for the group. Um, so the question is from an anonymous attendee wondering about genetic testing in the setting of peripartum cardiomyopathy. So um, actually, specifically, it says recovered peripartum cardiomyopathy. Um, so it, it for both the patient and their family members. So I'll let you take that one first, right? Yeah. So. This is an important question. So peripartum cardiomyopathy, for those of you who may not understand what that term means, that is cardiomyopathy that is diagnosed within, uh, within pregnancy. Technically, um, or at least officially, is in the last two months of pregnancy in the first uh, five months postpartum. Nevertheless, uh, additional studies have shown that really um, uh, Cardiomyopathy develops really almost any time during pregnancy, certainly in the in the second and third trimesters, uh, and then within six months postpartum would be considered peripartum cardiomyopathy. The question has always been: Is there something special about the peripartum situation which causes the cardiomyopathy, or is it just the stress of being pregnant with the extra workload on the heart? And there's no question: There's extra workload on the heart, um, and that question went away. What happened to that question? Oh, you took it away. Okay. Yeah. So I remember. So, so, so uh, in that question, it said this was recovered peripartum cardiomyopathy. Is genetic testing recommended? The answer, the bottom line answer is yes, it is recommended. Uh, and particularly because when that person presented with peripartum, the ejection fraction was, was in the 20s. Now, again, a normal ejection fraction should be in the 55 to 65% range at least. So uh, the ejection fraction of 20% is, is way low. That's is real trouble. And that this is, there's been recovery is, is a phenomenal result and it's wonderful. But the extent and the degree of the, um, of the um, peripartum cardiomyopathy suggests that this is, this is not a transient thing that this is the real deal. Um, so there, in, in, at least in my view, I would, without question, I would get genetic testing for that. Now, uh, I will, Elizabeth can, can extend this, but even when we know that it's absolutely genetic, we have multiple family members in a big family, multiple generations. So we know it's inherited. We know it's genetic. We can still only find about a third, 35, at most 40% of genetic cause, that's because we don't have it all figured out yet. So even if in your case of the peripartum cardiomyopathy question, the genetic testing would be negative, doesn't prove it's not genetic. We just can't figure it out. So Elizabeth, did I... Is that, yeah, is I think that I think you something? no, I think you addressed the question, and in fact, in our study, um, as for the, for the group, if you didn't see the data in the first presentation, even in these highly um, multiple generation pedigrees, as you describe, Ray, is that we we are only finding genetic cause in our study in about fifteen to twenty percent of cases. So, um, we this is in sort of the usual unsolved DCM cases. So. Um, 
um, it is, there's certainly still ground to plow when it comes to identifying genetic cause. I would, I would also then, um, one more uh, question about presentations that we didn't get to. Um, and this is from leftover from our previous uh, webinar, which they ask um, from a Portland, Oregon patient from the early days of the study that they found out that their idiopathic DCM or dilated cardiomyopathy is now considered arrhythmogenic right ventricular uh, cardiomyopathy or ARVC. Right. So could you explain the difference between these two? Yeah. Let me, uh, I actually have a slide. Uh, let me share my screen, um, come down to this. So the question is arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. So the normal heart, if you can see my pointer, uh, can you see my pointer, Elizabeth? Yeah, okay. The normal heart is up here on the top. Uh, normal left ventricle, a normal right ventricle, and the arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, that's been the usual, the classic description is ARVC or arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. We've changed the name uh, more recently to arrhythmogenic, but, but uh, you can see in the right ventricle, these yellow streaks, which are fatty streaks, and this right ventricle is dilated. And if we had a, a, an echo, it would show that that ventricle, instead of contracting vigorously, would be barely contracting. Um, that's the classic. It turns out that there's a lot of overlap. And um, the genes overlap between ARVC and dilated cardiomyopathy. Uh, in fact, we commonly see this. Um, and, and also the phenotypes, that is the clinical presentation is there's overlap between ARVC and DCM. And what I mean by that is we sometimes see really a classic dilated cardiomyopathy. The, the dilated phenotype is shown here in the left side where the, this is drawn predominantly as the left ventricle being dilated relatively thin. And of course, the ejection fraction, instead of pumping vigorously, that heart is barely pumping with a low ejection fraction. Generally, the classic dilated cardiomyopathy phenotype is both right and left dysfunction. Um, and, uh, and so we sometimes will, uh, in our either research or clinical uh, practice, we'll see uh, ARVC genes coming out of DCM. So there's a lot of overlap. So um, there, there is some, some sense that ARVC and data to support that that suggests that ARVC is more, has more malignant arrhythmias. Uh, and that might be relevant for getting an implantable cardiac defibrillator to deal with uh, potentially life-threatening arrhythmias in the patient earlier in the course of the disease if, if it were ARVC versus DCM. But that's, um, but in, but, but I, I hope that that's, I'll, I, I'm, I'm yammering on, I'll, I'll stop. Uh, but Elizabeth, if I haven't given it enough, uh, yeah, I think this no idea of there being a spectrum of, you know, things between the sort of classic DCM and classic ARVC is really what um, they probably are getting yeah. at. I'm seeing some questions too about um, what they can, what people can expect from the study from, uh, from genetic data and specifically gene sort of gene specific data. And I am, I can very <laughs> loudly say that we are pleased, very much looking forward to um, gene specific papers um, coming out of our, our research. We are like, like Ray said, in our final stages of variant adjudication and the last really the handful of variants um, that we're, we're tracking in families. Um, and we're particularly excited because we have family-based data on all of these variants as well. So this isn't just going to be, um, you know, case uh, case cohorts. We have uh, family and segregation data for these gene-specific papers that could be coming out. So um, yes, yeah, stay tuned. Hopefully sooner rather than later, that will be that will be coming. I, I I'm going to ask you a couple questions. Uh, sure. Uh, Anybody who's worked with Elizabeth knows that uh, she's. Uh, knows almost all the answers. So um, so here's an anonymous attendee that says, did you find several variants in different genes in the same patient? More often than not. <laughs> We have lots of multiple variant observations. Um, I, in fact, we uh, well, we we presented this data in the the reveal webinar, um, but um, the, you know, up to 
up to half of our patients have a, a VUS and um, many patients have <clears throat> multiple variants, either combinations of uncertain variants, which um, for those of you that aren't familiar with that terminology, uh, meaning that we, we found a variant in one of our genes that we, we know to be related to dilated cardiomyopathy, but um, we don't know if that gene actually causes DCM or not. Um, so we, we do find uncertain variants that are in this gray zone of whether we, we know or, or if they cause disease or not um, quite frequently. And um, we can see the multiple uncertain variants in, in individuals, but also combinations of disease causing variants with these uncertain variants. Um, so it is quite common and it's something that we're often sharing back to patients, this uh, multiple variant uh, effect. And hopefully we will understand that more as we continue to study these large families with multiple variants. I'm going to, I'm going to keep peppering you because their sure. questions are piling in. Um, so will the publications include more detailed phenotype information for specific genes? I'm thinking of, this is from Kara Barrett, uh, who was actually one of the first questions uh, now a few minutes ago. Uh, will the, um, I'm thinking of genes like FLNC that are newer and don't have as much in the literature currently. Yeah, um, Cara Barnett was one of, she's picking on me because I uh, mentored her when she was in graduate school at Ohio State. Um, so yes, Cara, we're picking backing off my first uh, comment. We are certainly, the data's coming. In fact, an FLNC paper's in preparation and come see our um, poster at NSG, at the National Society of Genetic Counselors Conference where we'll be, we'll be sharing some preliminary FLNC data. And I, I would, <clears throat> Uh, I would add, uh, Cara, that we um, um, we have enormous amount of data, and and it is incumbent upon us to to really get as much of it published as possible. We're going to be publishing right now. We're working on our what we call our big papers, our our phenotype papers, uh, um, uh, and and then a major genetics paper where that would be a global paper. Um, but then we're also working on gene-specific papers. And in fact, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Elizabeth, but I think FLNC has already been picked up and, and will is, is one of several gene-specific papers that would really drill down then on the phenotype data, which is, is very important to get out to the community. So um, here, here's one from Greg Ruff, actually. I have DCM. How do I best convince my family to get tested and why is it important? Uh, that's, a, uh, that's an Elizabeth question. Uh, yeah, no, this is this is where the rubber meets the road, I would say, you know, it, we figure all of this out, we make more sense out of the genetics of dilated cardiomyopathy, how do we make it make an impact and that's family members doing genetic testing and um, uptaking this information so we can actually screen them early at a uh, preventable or, or more treatable stage. Um, so there's that, that the way this is phrased, I'm, I'm thinking of two things. First of all, our study um, is, has trialed a communication tool called Family Heart Talk. Um, it's a booklet that was designed by providers and um, researchers and communication and, and health risk um, that was designed to help families do just this. It was a randomized trial. We had great balance between the, the groups of the um, of patients that were were given the tool. Um, this was across all of our sites in the consortium. And the data is still being dredged a bit, but our, our first pass at the results show that the trial was positive, that simply handing your family a booklet, um, the proband, the, the per first person diagnosed in the family with DCM, a booklet explaining what the genetic DCM is and why the family should be screened actually increased the likelihood that the family members would show up and get a, a cardiovascular genetic evaluation. Um, so that's the first, you know, that's how the one way to make it happen. Um, now, what the word I'm seeing in this uh, question is how do I convince them? I think that would be a, in that to me as a genetic counselor, um, I think a little bit more about how do you motivate someone and how do you make them feel that it's important? Um, this really hasn't been studied heavily in dilated cardiomyopathy. What is it that actually triggers someone to say, this is important? Um, and I, we do have many other behavioral studies that we hope to continue to, um, to, to do with our, our current 
um, surveys that we really haven't gotten into yet with our primary only with our focus on the primary analyses. Um, but we are going to continue to figure out what it is that families really makes families really communicate and really find the information important enough to be motivated for change. Okay. Um, here's one. God, it's a, this is really sad from Rhonda. Um, Paris, 22 year old male suffers sudden cardiac death. Okay, this is tragic. Um, <clears throat> diagnosed with dilated cardiomyopathy post mortem, two male siblings and parents have had negative echocardiograms as genetic testing warranted. Um, your, your pick, Elizabeth, you or me? Me? Okay. Well, I would say for sure. Um, there's really DCM, particularly earlier onset. Um, genetic testing, the data are not terribly robust, but, but there, is, there are data that suggest the earlier onset, in adults at least, uh, the greater the likelihood of finding a genetic cause. Um, so, um, and if there's the, the real issue with this sometimes, if there's a post-mortem, uh, hopefully there is some uh, blood or other tissue kept so that a DNA source is available for genetic testing. Um, and many of the companies have um, these types of analyses available. Um, usually has to be uh, based upon family payment, but, but actually Elizabeth is better at this than I am of explaining all of that. And we've worked with, unfortunately, with, with many families who have suffered this, these tragedies and have lost loved ones and then want to have genetic testing either for cardiomyopathy or for the channelopathies, arrhythmia genes. And uh, Elizabeth, any additional comments? No, other than I think the, that's a great question and it's important that you're thinking about it. Um, take, if there is opportunity to do genetic testing post-mortem, it can be incredibly informative for future generations. And without belaboring this, it has become much more affordable. Um, so certainly talk to a genetics provider that might be accessible to you to, about what options might be available because you might be surprised with, with how um, affordable it might be. I, there's some questions about um, sort of testing recommendations. So um, either of us can take this, but I'll give it to you, Dr. Hirschberger. Um, so th this person is asking, saying that their sister is a transplant recipient um, and the okay. family uh, participates in the study. Um, they have a ejection fraction on the low side of normal and wondering how often they should be checked yeah. for DCM. Yeah, so... We um, we did publish guidelines on this uh, actually first in 2009 with the Heart Failure Society and then we the Heart Failure Society one of those redone and those were redone in 2018 and in, in in association with the American College of Medical Genetics so the guidelines are guidelines and it if, um, um, and if it, it's sort of a span of one to five years. Uh, so it, it it does need some clinical insight and judgment. So if an EF is on the low side of normal, I would say at least every couple of years. Um, and then the other the other comment is depending if it's really a difficult echo, anywhere from ten to twenty percent of echoes will sometimes have inadequate windows or. Uh, the 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 data will not be quite as good. It just has to do with body habitus, and it doesn't really have anything to do with 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 size or gender or anything like that. It's just some echoes. Most echoes are great, but some aren't. If there's any question about measuring an ejection fraction or heart size, getting good measurements, then consider cardiac magnetic resonance imaging, an MRI of the heart. Much more accurate uh, numbers. Uh, ejection fraction, heart size, um, uh, all of that. So, uh, and and then certainly if the ejection fraction is, you know, 50, 51, uh, I would probably do it uh, at least initially on an annual basis. And at some point, then some cardiologists will need to decide if this really is sort of sliding into cardiomyopathy territory where you really want to start medications and then try to get that ejection fraction to come back up. 
difficult. These gray areas are very difficult. On the one hand, I'm very conservative about starting medications for people who don't need it. And an injection fraction of 54, 55 is perfectly fine and you can live forever with that. In fact, you can live forever with an ejection fraction of 50 or probably 48. It's really this idea of preventing the slide from in the 40s into the 30s or 20s. And it's, we don't really have the data. That's one of the things we'd like to get, get the data on the study going forward. So. I have one more for you. Uh-oh. No, this is a recurrent one that we we get in okay. these about non-compaction. Um, oh, non-compaction. Yeah, so this one came up again with a, a participant in our group. So um, they acknowledge up front knowing that left ventricular non-compaction in the context of dilated cardiomyopathy has been debated. Um, have Do we have any new insights about how LVNC yeah. should be approached from a clinical standpoint? Um, and they provide an example, which is an interesting one. So no, say you find a patient with dilated cardiomyopathy yeah. and if you screen a relative if they have LVNC what does that mean? Yeah so the short answer is from the study standpoint we really have essentially no data. Part of that reason was by study design even though we had 12 million dollars the amount of money we had to do a really high quality echo we just didn't have it and so the echoes we did at our uh, at our sites our 25 plus sites were a sort of the cheapest screening echo we could get, a research echo that gave us LV, LV size, LV function, and, and that was about it. Um, and in terms of really drilling down to try to figure out whether LVNC was present or not, that echocardiographic criteria just couldn't do it, just didn't have the resources to do it. Um, the CMR study, which we are just starting now, which I mentioned, that will be with uh, roughly 600 family members, already enrolled family members, selected by, by what their genetic testing showed, path, likely path, or a variant of unknown significance. We would have the data there. We haven't actually considered that, but it would be a question that, that we could address, uh, although it's a much smaller subset. And, and then in general, um, I have uh, this uh, person who's asking the question may know that I have contributed a, a couple of uh, an editorial and other uh, material in our reviews and stuff that suggests that LVNC is really epiphenomenon. It's really not a key part of the DCM phenotype. That's, that's, that's supported by data. We don't have, uh, although the LVNC literature is really quite diverse and I would never claim to have a corner on truth or uh, anything like that. So I, I do think we have more, more to, to learn. Unfortunately, I'm not, certainly our current study, our current data will not help solve that, so. There's one here that um, I would be glad to take and we see these occasionally, but not often. So um, the question is about someone that had proactive genetic testing who I presume is um, healthy themselves, but concerned about their family history of heart disease. So they they went through a commercial laboratory to have a, a genetic screen for uh, for heart disease, and were found to have three uncertain variants that are associated with a variety of different types of heart disease. Um, interestingly, what this person is sharing is that what drove them to do this is that the they have a father who who uh, died of heart or a grandfather that died of heart disease at 52 and a father um, with heart disease at age 60. Um, it looks like it must have been due to blockages um, because they had a bypass procedure. So uh, the question is, should I be following up with somebody about this? Um, my my answer to that, and Dr. Hirschberger, you might want to comment too, but um, would be probably um, without knowing all of the, the details of what it is that uh, what types of heart disease your grandfather had that age of 52, you know, this is starting to get outside of potentially DCM. It could be, you know, most of gen genetic heart disease is, is still within coronary artery disease or, or blockages of the arteries. So um, if, if this is something related to if what your grandfather had under the age or at the age of 52, um, that would be within premature coronary heart disease range and uh, reasonable to explore. Um, certainly drove you to get genetic testing, so reasonable to talk talk to, to somebody about. Um, and one of those genes that you list here, that APOB gene, um, can, can be related to some of that. So um, the answer is, yeah, if your, your family history is enough to, to talk a little bit more about what that might mean for you.
Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to, I'm looking at this last question, Elizabeth, uh, which is um, a lot of information. Let me look through this here. Um, boy. Yeah, so um, I'm not going to, this is a long question from an anonymous attendee. A person who had peripartum cardiomyopathy and then a daughter with a, um, um, a syndrome called POTS, which is a, ortho, uh, a, a, a low blood pressure thing when you stand up and, and um, it's, it's a real problem. And, and, and then other events in the, in, in the family. It turns out that I would just say as a global comment, even though we have come light years in the last 20 years in terms of knowledge of DCM genetics, what we need to know is probably that much, and what we actually know is about that much. And and uh, and I would say particularly, we we have found the big genes, the the Lamin gene, the the FLNC, uh, the MYH7. We can name off these genes, the genes that we work with all the time, the big nasty genes we know about, but we still only know about 35% of genetics when it's we know it's in a family, we know it's genetic. And so it just shows how, how little we actually know when it comes right down to it, much less the rest of the story, the rest of the environmental impact. There's a question on the, uh, that Elizabeth and I reviewed the questions from the prior uh, event, and there was one about smoking and alcohol and uh, being overweight and other kinds of things. Environmental factors, globally, bad air, you know, pollution, uh, all kinds of things you can imagine. We don't, we don't really understand those interactions with, with, this, with these big genes much at all. So unfortunately, the answer to this anonymous attendee's question about the dysautonomia and the COVID-19 and all these other environmental factors that could be triggers for DCM, we just have no data. I, I'm just, and it's, it's, it's gotta be the next generation of investigators. Uh, we're trying to plow the, the ground uh, now that we can. And this is gonna be for Elizabeth et al to, to finish up. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, I on the topic of complexity, there's another question here that's actually from a patient with a, another subtype of cardiomyopathy called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And the question to us is um, this person that has HCM, should they have been tested for DCM genes? They were only tested for HCM genes. Um, you know, this is a highly clinical and specific question to you and your family. So the, the, you know, if you were to have signs of DCM in you and your family, it wouldn't be unreasonable to ask that question to um, the person that's been coordinating your genetic testing. But just a comment that um, we do have a handful of cases where there are mixed um, phenotypes or, or presentations in the family where we can see both um, DCM or dilated cardiomyopathy and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or features of um, both and within the same family tree. Um, and often in those cases, we are seeing also multiple variants that, um, that are running through the family that might explain the differences between these individuals. Um, so if there's concern about that based on what you've experienced in your family, just know that it's something that we have been coming across in our sort of rigorous clinical and genetic data that we're collecting in the study. Dan, how are we doing on time? Uh, we're doing great. We could take another uh, another question or two. Okay. Um, and uh, just, a, a, just a comment back out to Rhonda, I, um, who had shared the 22-year-old uh, son who died. Uh, this is such a tragic thing. And again, my heart goes out to you. I, I've dealt with this dozens, scores of times uh, with families and it's so, so troubling. Um, let's see, Elizabeth, um, actually this, this top question, question here, most discussion DCM is treating the dilatation of squeezing or the ejection fraction. What about treatment of arrhythmias, heart block, PVCs, VTAC? My uh, electrophysiologist is treating me with traditional methods, but there, are there studies for genetic DCM on the electrical side of things, in particular LAM and DCM? Uh, LAM and DCM is really a kind of a one-off that presents with prominent 
conduction system disease, heart block, needing pacemakers, and then nasty arrhythmias, both supraventricular, this would be atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, as well as ventricular arrhythmias, ventricular tachycardia VF, ventricular fibrillation. So um, Lamin is, um, there actually is a, a clinical trial ongoing with Lamin right now. Um, it's not gene specific, uh, but, but, um, uh, but we do, if you have an arrhythmia problem, you end up at an EP, the EP will tend to send you to a heart failure a cardiologist and vice versa. We, we work together, it's a team effort. Um, and I think ultimately, I think the treatment for many of these genetic cardiomyopathies will be gene therapy. And I mean, gene specific therapy. Um, and we don't have time to go into that tonight, but, but I'll, I'll stop there. Elizabeth, is there one more we can do? Um, I actually might take just one that we didn't have a chance to get to in the reveal program, and that was um, a, a participant had asked uh, if if people that are in gene negative families should still keep track of their family members, um, and the answer is definitely yes. <laughs> get it, get them all, get everybody engaged as much as you can. Start this conversation about genetic cardiomyopathies. We have a lot still to solve. Um, our data show that. Other people's data show that. There's there's more. Um, um, genetics to learn about uh, about dilated cardiomyopathy. So even if you're gene panel negative, we still think that there's a genetic background to what you and your family have experienced. And hopefully one day we will have the opportunity to solve that, retest you and figure this out for the future generations. And just a plug for future studies, uh, we are angling to actually do a much larger study and any of any of the participants on the call tonight who are not part of our research studies, but have DCM in the family, love to have you participate. We'll of course get word out uh, when we get funding for that, uh, which we need to uh, generate. So Jan, maybe we should turn it back to you. Sounds great. Thank you both so much. Uh, it's so informative and, and we've had great questions. Um, it's, uh, it's really a, a very informative event. Um, Next, uh, I want, just want to let you know that we are pleased to share information now about some of the latest DCM therapies in development. Um, and if you stay tuned, this is a little video um, clip. Um, and if you stay tuned afterwards, we have some additional information about what's coming up in September. So go ahead, Heather, if you want to. Tanaya is shaping the future of heart disease treatment through a bold mission to develop therapies that address the underlying causes of heart diseases and conditions. Tanaya is addressing many heart conditions that affect both children and adults. Some forms are genetic and are inherited in families. Our approaches to new therapies are diverse and draw on three scientific platforms, gene therapy, regeneration, and precision medicine. Our initial focus is on using gene therapy to repair cells that are malfunctioning due to genetic mutation. Gene therapy has been shown to be safe and highly effective in multiple clinical trials targeting different organs. We are building on these advances to bring gene therapy to the heart. Gene therapies are delivered using a modified version of a virus containing a healthy copy of a gene to replace a gene that is not working properly. Tanaya's approach is designed to deliver therapies directly to the heart. Tanaya's lead program focuses on addressing mutations of the MyBPC3 gene, the leading cause of genetic hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We will not stop until we have helped every person with heart disease reach their own peak. Contact us to learn more about our natural history study. Thank you for joining our webinar presented by Bristol Myers Squibb and the DCM Foundation on hope for MYH and TTN DCM patients. I'm Greg Ruff, president of the DCM Foundation. Founded in 2017, our mission is to provide hope and support 
to DCM patients and family members through research, advocacy, and education. We would like to thank our generous sponsor, Bristol Myers Squibb, for their important work in the field of genetic DCM. Our presenter today is Dr. Neil Lakdawalla, a cardiovascular medicine specialist at Brigham and Women's Hospital. He is also at Harvard Medical School. He received his medical degree from the University of Texas and completed a residency and chief residency in internal medicine at Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center. Dr. Lakdawalla is board certified in internal medicine, cardiovascular disease, and advanced heart failure and transplant cardiology. He is actively working in genetic cardiomyopathy in clinic and research. Thanks, Greg. Dilated cardiomyopathy, which is also called DCM, is a disease of the heart muscle that affects the main pumping chamber, the left ventricle of the heart. In this disease, the left ventricle becomes weak and cannot pump blood to meet the body's needs as well as a healthy heart can. In general, the heart becomes enlarged or dilated as the disease progresses. The symptoms of DCM include shortness of breath, fatigue, fainting, swelling of lower extremities, and palpitations. DCM has many causes and can be acquired or inherited. Inherited means your parents passed a variant in a gene associated with the disease one to you. This genetic variant is also referred to as a mutation. This type of DCM is called genetic DCM. Research has been ongoing to look for the specific genetic link to cardiomyopathy, including DCM, and to explore how the genes cause or contribute to the various types of disease. The true numbers for how common DCM is and the proportion of DCM that is genetically caused are not fully known. Current estimates are that up to one in 250 people have DCM. Amongst patients with DCM, about one third have inherited the disease as a familial condition. While genetic causes of DCM can be identified in patients with familial disease, genetic mutations are also present in patients without a clear family history of DCM. Current research has identified over 30 different genes associated with this disease, but the majority of causes are linked to 12 genes. TTN and MYH7 are two genes that are affected in DCM. It is estimated that TTN mutations account for 12 to 25% of DCM, and MYH7 mutations account for approximately 5% of DCM. From the TTN gene, a protein called Titan is created. From the MYH7 gene, the protein named beta-myosin heavy chain is created, and both proteins play important roles for heart muscle contraction or for the pumping ability of the heart. Mutations in these genes impair the ability of the heart to function properly. At this time, there are no approved medications that target these mutations to help increase the pumping action of the heart, improve the heart's function, or slow disease progression. Danacamptive is an investigational drug that Bristol-Myers Squibb BMS, is studying for this disease. In previous studies in humans and animals, danacamptive enhanced contraction of the heart muscle. Currently, BMS is studying danacamptive in an ongoing clinical trial in the US and parts of Europe in patients with DCM caused by MYH7 and TTN mutations. This trial aims to further evaluate the safety and cardiovascular effects of danacamptive on the heart's pumping ability. BMS is studying how danacamptive might work for patients who have DCM caused by mutations in these two genes. Patients who qualify for the study will need to meet these following requirements. They need to have stable primary DCM due to either MYH7 or TTN gene variants and be 18 to 80 years of age at screening. If there are family members who have DCM in the exact same gene variant, up to three total family members can participate in this study. In order to qualify, patients cannot have any of the following criteria, but not limited to any other genetic variants causing DCM other than MYH7 or TTN, any significant structural heart abnormalities, such as valvular heart disease, unstable heart conditions, and or the need for frequent treatments in clinic to maintain heart failure stability certain abnormal blood tests which may prevent safe and effective study conduct. You can find more information about the study on the clinicaltrials.gov website by searching for Dana Camptive. 
You can also find the active study site's contact information on this website. You can also email to clinical.trials at bms.com to learn more information about this study. We appreciate your interest in this study. Thank you. To everyone, we hope you are enjoying the conference. On behalf of the HELM DCM study team, thank you for the opportunity to present the outline of our phase three study of PF803 and dilated cardiomyopathy associated with lamin AC gene mutation. My name is Franca Angeli and I'm the global clinical lead for rare cardiology at Pfizer. PF803 is an investigational product that inhibits P38 alpha MAP kinase. P38 alpha MAP kinase is activated in human hearts of patients with lamin AC dilated cardiomyopathy. And treatment of PF803 improved cardiac function and life span in models of LMNA related DCM. A phase two study was successfully completed with PF803 and we are currently recruiting participants to complete our ongoing phase three study. Our HELM DCM study will randomize, or in other words, assign by chance, up to 160 participants to receive either PF803 or placebo. Once the last participants complete six months of follow-up, all participants that remain in the study may receive the study drug. The main objective of HELM DCM is to evaluate the effects of PF803 on functional capacity measured by six minute walk test at six months. This trial may be right for you if you are older than 18 years old, have heart failure related symptoms, have either an implanted cardioverted defibrillator or a cardiac resynchronization therapy defibrillator and have LMNA DCM. As an important note, genetic testing to confirm if you have a causative LMNA mutation is offered as part of the study. And our study physicians will be available to review with you all the criteria to ensure that this study may be right for you. We have over 60 sites open in North America, Europe, and Latin America, with close to 30 sites in the West available to assist you. If you are interested in learning more about a study, please go to Pfizer Clinical Trials Portal using the link www.helmdcm.com or call us at 1-800-887-7002. On behalf of the Helm DCM study, thank you again for your attention. Hello, everyone. Again, um, I just wanted to thank all of our DCM sponsors. Heather, I'm not sure if you have that slide again, uh, but we couldn't do the work that we do without our DCM sponsors, and we thank them greatly for their help. There they are. So just take a quick moment. Um, we will also share all of this information on our website, um, and we will, of course, have a recording of this webinar available on our website afterwards. If you have additional questions or information that you'd like about any of the clinical trials you've seen there, please don't hesitate to reach out to us at info at dcmfoundation.org. And next slide. Again, thank you for attending tonight. Thank you to our presenters and to Heather assisting us behind the scenes. To learn more, learn more about DCM or to view past webinars, please visit dcmfoundation.org. For regular updates, please follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And finally, I uh, just wanna put in a plug for next month's webinar, which will be held on Wednesday, September 22nd from 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern time 
when we'll be joined by guest speaker Doug Raychak. And the topic is living with a pacemaker or ICD device. And I think you'll find this very informative. Doug is a, a fun speaker. He has uh, quite a following actually on YouTube. And so we will send out additional information. You can register on our website. There's information there already. Um, at, again, it's dcmfoundation.org. Thank you all so much. I hope you have a wonderful evening. Thanks for, for spending an hour of it with us and be well, stay safe, and uh, we'll see you next month. Take care for now. Bye-bye.